Welcome to the Monday Morning Haskell video blog, and in this video, we're going to discuss one of the most well-known algorithms in all of programming, and this is the quicksort algorithm. We'll consider the code for different approaches in Haskell and compare this to a more common language like Python. We'll especially consider the question of what it means for us to do an in-place sort in Haskell where our values and expressions are typically immutable, meaning that we can't change them. We'll look at the Haskell APIs that actually make this possible. Before we get into any language specific thoughts though, let's review what this algorithm looks like at a high level. Quicksort is of course a sorting algorithm. So we might imagine we have a list or an array of ordered values like these circles with their indicated numbers. We'd like to place these items in order preferably as quickly as possible. The quicksort algorithm begins with a partition step. We choose one element at random to be our pivot element. So we'll reorganize our whole array around this element. So let's suppose we choose this first number, six. Partitioning now means we make two separate lists, the first containing all the elements that are smaller than six, and the second containing all the elements that are larger than six. Now let's visualize that we could place the pivot element 6 in between these two lists. While our whole list isn't all correct just yet, we at least know that 6 is in the correct spot, and that no elements will need to cross over 6 to get to their correct final location. And after this, we can then run the exact same algorithm on each of the two halves of the list. So on the left side of the 6, and on the right side, we once again choose a partition, divide those lists, and continue what we call a recursive process. A list that has zero or one elements is already sorted, and this is our base case. It doesn't require any more work, and we know that the element is correctly placed. Eventually, all the branches of our algorithm come back together, and our list is sorted. By breaking the problem down into recursive subproblems, this algorithm achieves a time complexity of O of n log n in the average case. This means that as the input size n becomes very large, the algorithm's runtime scales with this size multiplied by its logarithm. This turns out to be the theoretical lower bound for comparison-based sorting, though there are a few other algorithms that also achieve this. Because this algorithm is recursive, we can actually describe it rather succinctly in our code so it's worth looking at how we do this. But before I start flashing lots of code on the screen at you, I'll note that you don't need to get every single detail in the code from this video. If you want to look at all of the samples that I'll be showing, you can just go to the GitHub link in the description for this video below. With that disclaimer out of the way, here's all the code we need to describe this algorithm in Python. Notice how, from within our quicksort function, we call quicksort again. This works out because each time we call quicksort, the input is smaller. And eventually, the input will be of size 0 and will hit this base case. You could also include size 1 in the base case as well. In fact, that's how our animations treat it, but both ways work. So looking at the rest of this function, we make the left and right lists. We sort each of those and then combine them together, and that's our result. We can replicate this same approach in Haskell. First, we set up our base case. Then, we filter the two sides of the list, quick sort each side, and then combine them together. These definitions are nice and compact, and they give us a powerful algorithm with very little code. But even though they're fast in time complexity, as we discussed before, they aren't optimal in space complexity. We can observe that both of these require the construction of a new list that is the same size as the input list. This means they require O of n space. This isn't horrible since that's as much space as the original list was using anyways, but it would be nice if we didn't have to copy the entire list. Quicksort, it turns out, can be done in place. This means that instead of creating new lists to hold elements, we're going to perform all our comparisons and all movement of elements within the same array. 
To do this, we keep track of a pivot index with this orange arrow, in addition to the yellow arrow showing our pivot element. We must loop through the elements, which we'll track using the white arrow below. Now, this orange arrow refers to the first element in the right side of the list as we partition it. As we perform this loop, we need to take action every time we encounter an element that is smaller than the pivot element. We must swap this element with the existing pivot index and then increment the index to indicate the boundary has shifted. When all is said and done, the true pivot sits within the left side of our array at index 0. So we swap it with the final element in the left side right before the orange pivot index. Now our array is partitioned. But now, how does the recursive step work? If we never make any smaller arrays, how do we call our function with a smaller input? The answer is that we had two extra parameters. These indicate the start index of our sort and the end index, or really one past the end index. So we can imagine them as a shifting window of interest. For a single call to this function, we only sort the elements within the particular window. So for our first call, this window is just zero and then the full length of the array. But now that we've partitioned once, we'll make two recursive calls. The first will act on all the elements from the old start value up through the pivot index. Then it will act on the right side of the list, starting with one past the pivot and going to the end. We'll run through the full partition and recursive process on each side, and then our list is sorted without needing to create a new container list. To get this optimization, though, our code can't be as succinct as it was before, but we can still break it down into roughly four parts. To start, we want a helper function that can swap the items at two indices in our array. Simple enough. Then we need our partition function, which has these window parameters for the start and end. It selects the first element as the pivot, loops through the remaining items, performs one final swap, and then returns the pivot index. Then we'll have a helper function that actually runs the quicksort routine. It partitions the array and then recursively calls itself on the subsections of the, the array as divided by the pivot index. Finally, the main quicksort function is just a wrapper around our helper. It calls the helper with the initial window of zero and the length of the list. Again, to get more into the details, you can take a look at the exact code on GitHub, but hopefully it's clear already that this is a bit more complicated than our original version. Now, this presents a real quandary for Haskell because Haskell expressions are immutable. They can't change. This doesn't mean every single operation creates a whole new data structure. For example, map.insert returns a new map, but it doesn't actually make a fresh copy of everything in the input map. Maps can get away with this because of how their memory works. But for a sorting algorithm, we want to use an array. Arrays have this double slash operator that might appear to modify an existing array but because of how array memory works, it will return a fresh copy with the new indicated elements. So how can an in-place modification even be possible with immutable data? 
Well, when something seems impossible in Haskell, the usual answer is that we need to encapsulate that behavior in a monad so that it, it can be constrained to certain portions of our code at compile time. We'll see two different examples of this. But first, let's look at the interface that combines them. This interface is a type class, mArray or mutable array. This class has three different parameters. It has an array type, an element type, and a monad. It specifies that we can make in-place modifications to the array containing elements of the given type as long as we are in the specified monad. Here are some of the functions we can use with this type class. Read array and write array allow us to read and write individual elements of our array at the given indices. Then get lms, get bounds, and new list array correspond to similar functions that exist for normal arrays. Of course, all of these must take place within the monad we've specified. But these abstract functions aren't very useful to us without a concrete implementation. So the first array type we'll consider is the IO array. An IO array works very much like the normal array type, being parameterized by an index and an element type. However, unlike a normal array, it really functions more like a traditional pointer in C or C++. The array is a space that is allocated in memory, and hence we can pass it to different threads that can manipulate the values in the array. We can take all of the functions for the mArray class and define them in terms of the IO array. As you might expect, in order to use the IO array, we need the IO monad. This fills the M role from the MRA class. All of our functions are now IO functions. How then does this respect Haskell's immutability? This will actually make more sense if we compare directly to a couple of different but easily confused types in C++. The first listed here is a pointer to a const int, and the second is a const pointer to an int. In the first case, the integer itself is constant. We are not able to change the value that is stored in that memory space. However, the pointer is not const, so we can change the pointer so that it points to a different place in memory. Hence, this pointer will have a different underlying value, but any other thread pointing to the original memory spot sees the same value. The second type is a const pointer. In this case, we cannot change where it points. We cannot shift it to a different piece of memory, but we can, in fact, change the underlying value at that memory location, which would also update it for other threads. So what does this have to do with the IO array? Well, you might expect that with immutability, our values would work like the first example, where the values themselves are fixed. But in reality, it actually fits in the second paradigm. The pointer is immutable. It always points to the same memory. But one of the many functions of the IO monad is that it can directly mutate memory. Hence, an IO array is an immutable pointer to a particular space of memory whose underlying values are mutable. And this is how Haskell can give us data that we can modify in place for our sorting algorithm without violating its fundamental idea of immutability. With these tools at our disposal, we can start writing quick sort in Haskell. We'll follow the structure of our Python implementation. The first function we'll implement is swap. This is where the main mutation action actually takes place. Within the IO monad, we can take our input array, read the existing values at the given indices, and then write those values out in a swapped fashion so that the i value goes to j and the j value goes to i. The partition code is a little trickier than in Python. Haskell doesn't use traditional for loops. We need a state monad action to track the pivot index, and this action should also be able to perform swaps. Then we map this action over the different indices in this part of the array. This is definitely the most intricate part of the algorithm, so I encourage you to take a closer look 
at the code linked below and try it out for yourself. And then we have our quicksort helper. Our partition function is monadic, so we just call that, get our pivot index, and then make our recursive calls. And finally, our main wrapper function gets the bounds of our array and then calls the helper. And that completes our algorithm. These are our five type signatures, but they're all specialized to use IO array specifically. But in a lot of cases, we don't want to force our user to be in the IO monad. This is why we have the M array type class interface. This is what it looks like when we change our type signatures to accommodate any M array. Notice we introduce the M array constraint as well as many constraints on the particular index type we'll use. Any one of Haskell's integral types will satisfy these constraints. But overall, nothing will really change with the code itself. Now that our code is generalized, let's talk about a second way to use it besides IO array. There is also the concept of an ST array. An ST array provides a mutable interface that does not rely on the IO monad is restricted solely to the manipulation of the given array rather than opening the door for all kinds of side effects like IO does. We can use the M array interface with the ST array, but it comes with its own monad, the ST monad. For this particular implementation, we'll also use another function in the M array interface that we ignored before. The thaw function takes a pure immutable representation of the data and turns it into a mutable representation. Thus, it takes a normal array and produces an ST array within the ST monad. If we pass in an ST array to the exact same quicksort function now, it will work just fine. This is a valid specialization of the more general type signature we gave to this function. We can use this to write a pure version of our quicksort. This will simply take a normal array as input and produce a normal array as output. We use run st array to activate the st monad action. It will use this function thaw to give us a mutable version of the input array, and then it will run our existing quicksort algorithm. The algorithm itself will be run in place, but note that the thaw process will make a copy of the array. Thus, this pure approach will still use O of n memory. There's one last item I want to mention. I would be remiss if I talked about quicksort without mentioning the shortcut I've been taking so far in the algorithm. Currently, we always use the first element of the window as the pivot. It turns out that this actually gives very slow runtime in cases where the array is either already sorted if it's in reverse order or if it's close to one of these situations. To get the optimal runtime on average across all these cases, we want to choose the pivot index at random. In Python, this is fairly simple. We slip in this call to random.randint while we are partitioning and we're on our way. In Haskell though, introducing such non-determinism is trickier. We actually want to change several of our function signatures so that they now take a random generator as an input and produce it as an output. Just from this high level overview, hopefully you can see that this process is a bit more invasive than it was in Python. But there are good reasons for this principle in Haskell. If you want to compare these versions, you can look at quicksort in place in the test code linked below for the non-random version and quicksort final for the code that incorporates the random generator. So I hope you enjoyed this explanation of how we can get uh, in-place modifications for a sorting algorithm in Haskell. I hope to do uh, a follow-up video in the future uh, on the, more of the details of this quicksort algorithm, especially the that intricate uh, partition step that we have. If you liked this video, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also sign up for the Monday morning Haskell mailing list. There's a link to that in the description, and that will give you access to our subscriber-only resources. And these are very helpful, especially if you're interested in starting out and learning the Haskell language. Last of all, I want to give a shout out to 3Blue1Brown, whose channel is also linked 
in the description. This video is my submission to their Summer of Math Exposition uh, contest, and uh, you know it really inspired me to make some more interesting visuals uh, for this video. So I hope you enjoyed it.